Okay, so I've titled this um, brief presentation this evening, Shifting Perspectives. Um, and I'm, what I'm planning to do is to take you through um, how, uh, what my own journey has been like over the last couple of years, because my own personal perspective has shifted rather significantly uh, after a, a career change. Um, and then some of the kind of full starts I had getting into the uh, into the area of kind of land management before finally happen, happening upon uh, holistic management and beginning to to really grind out some process and get some uh, grind out some programs and getting some uh, getting some clarity over the vision and what I was trying to achieve. So my uh, my own background, uh, I was born in, in London um, back in the uh, mid eighties and um, I grew up there until uh, um, I was eleven. And in that time, I came back to Donegal every, uh, pretty much every summer and every Easter. Both of my parents are from here, and uh, I lived this kind of disjointed life of uh, being an uh, inner city video game addicted kid uh, for part of the year, and then to being this kind of slightly feral, wilder kind of kid in the hills uh, for the for the times when I was in Donegal. <clears throat> After moving back here at eleven. Um, I, uh, I went to school here and then finally um, ended up, well, ended up going to college in uh, Letterkenny to study engineering. And um, at that time, the um, I didn't realize it, but looking back in hindsight, um, the subliminal message at the time was very much unchanged even to today. And it's that there's a perception that there's limited opportunity in these hills and, and these landscapes so that um, if the going's good at all, you kind of get out, you broaden your horizon, and you go away as far as you can. Um, and that's kind of what I did. So I uh, I studied engineering and then uh, fell into a role in the oil and gas industry. And then for the following sort of 12 years, um, I kicked around the world um, on various exploration and production projects. So I was involved in the drilling side of things. It was all about being in wild places um, with big bits of kit and with great tight teams of people. Um, pulling hydrocarbons out of the ground as quickly as we could. So on the left there is, um, I think that was my first or second trip offshore in the UK North Sea, uh, and that was the first ever well test I was on, um, which is where basically after completing uh, construction of a well, you strap a test assembly onto your rig and you uh, flow the hydrocarbons from the reservoir directly to surface. This thing going off 50 meters away from you sounds like a jet engine. Um, it's pretty impressive and for that period in my life I felt like I was definitely in the right game. Uh, the picture on the right there is uh, near the border uh, with Yemen uh, in Oman and um, I had sort of two and a half years there uh, in and out of country drilling in these kind of remote locations. It was like the back of the moon. It was um, a very adventurous sort of time in my life and uh, yeah at the time I felt um, completely uh, fulfilled. Um, so yeah, the, uh, over the next few years, then I, <clears throat> I spent some time in North Africa and then came back and based in London for the final few years uh, of my time in the industry and dipping in and out of Asia to some projects in Singapore. And everything was going right. Everything uh, career-wise, the trajectory was fine, uh, earning lots of money and getting to go to all these cool places. But uh, there was something deeper down in me that was, um, that was, there was a growing sense of uh, unfulfillment. And I wasn't quite sure what that was. So um, uh, I was um, kind of suffering really from that kind of city-based lifestyle, you know, too much food, too much uh, booze perhaps, uh, certainly burning the candle at both ends. And uh, it was on one of these breaks away from the city into, into Wales that I, um, I visited a small community woodland project and uh, just because I had a free Saturday morning. And um, it was during this time uh, being led through this woodland that, uh, the, the, the guy that was leading the tour began speaking about the natural systems that were uh, in play around us in a way that I had never heard anybody describe them in this way. And what he was really focusing on was the interconnections between the various layers in the ecosystem. And uh, the, the majority of his own presentation that day or, or, or his own talk and walk that day uh, could be boiled down to a couple of sentences which ended up completely changing my life and it was that this productive uh, resilient abundant system um, is what happens when man takes his hands off the wheel and sort of steps away and uh, you begin tapping it these natural systems fall into order 
initially they fall through a, a, a phase of chaos and then they fall into order and they begin building resilience through diversity. And that blew me away, to be honest, because in my current lifestyle, uh, in my current career at that time, um, I was spending um, uh, millions and millions of dollars, uh, man hours, woman hours, uh, and many, many tons of carbon being re released into the atmosphere, trying to fight nature at every cause, uh, trying to contain poor pressures and deal with geological uh, troubles, um, political uh, issues and unrest in certain part of the world. And it struck me how um, everything in my being at that moment in time was was completely focused on working against nature. But yet here I was being presented with this productive, resilient, abundant system. And I think for me, that was the beginning of the end uh, for the for the oil, for the oil and gas. So, so uh, John, and around that. Yep. Yeah, sorry. John, this is Sheila. And um, it's, I think some people are having trouble hearing you. And so just a couple ideas. One is to just come really close to the microphone. And then two is to just minimize the sound on the desktop. And that will help improve the quality of the sound. Okay, you try that. So around about, um, around about that time, um, my father died. And uh, he was in his early 60s at the time of his death. And I realized that um, I was kind of halfway through, you know, I was uh, around about 30 years of age. And I had to, you know, I had a bit of an early midlife crisis, if you like. And uh, the question had to be asked, you know, did I want to spend the next 30, 40 years of my life um, uh, following the same uh, train that I was on? And the answer to that was unequivocally no. So I decided to um, to leave the industry at that time and, and certain things conspire to uh, to enable my um, my exit including a dip in oil price um, so it allowed me to quite nicely uh, exit stage left and um, I began this sort of journey into um, into initially into permaculture um, woodland management and ultimately into um, the world of regenerative agriculture and uh, holistic management so where we are at the moment is um, this is a, a map of um, the north part of Ireland and you can see Scotland just broaching in on the right hand side there and uh, Donegal is um, this part of uh, this part of uh, Ireland here just between the Atlantic and the, the border with Northern Ireland and where the, the farm is based is just on the edge of that on the southern fringe of that green dot that green blob the green blob being Glenvey National Park um, the farm here uh, is a it's a family farm. So uh, if we trace back uh, some of the, the the history of um, of land ownership in this area over the last kind of 120 years or so, we see that the farm is made up through multiple acquisitions, and that's why we've ended up with this kind of disjointed um, farm across um, five sites. Um, so the top uh, the top part of the farm, that grey matter. That kind of grey brownie um, section by the cloud. This is Glenbay National Park, and outside of it then is uh, is the majority of the farmland um, in our area. This is Garden Lake, and the village of Churchill is just at the far end of this lake, and we're about fourteen kilometres or so from Letterkenny. So we're in central Donegal, which means we're pretty wet. Um, we get about um, 2, 2.1, 2.2 meters of rain here. These are the average rainfall figures over the last, um, what, 30 odd years, 34 years. Um, and you can see that it's about a third of the time we're above two, uh, two meters. And sometimes we're, um, we're, you know, as low as kind of 15, 1600 mil, which is still fairly high. Um, some of the interesting kind of insights into this trend monitoring is that um, with, you know, the climate's a, a, a big topic of discussion at the moment, is that our, um, it doesn't look like our uh, overall rainfall figures um, or even temperature figures are really varying that much when we look at uh, averages. But when we mine the data a bit more, we can see that, the, that there's massive um, variations in the peak events that do come along. For example, 2008, we, uh, 2018, we had a, a really extended dry period in Ireland. I think pretty much everybody suffered. Um, and then in 2017, we had um, 
one of the wettest Augusts um, on record. Um, something like 183% of the quarter's rain fell within that month. Um, the maximum event being um, resulted in some flooding up in Inishon, where um, something like 65 mil of rain fell in six hours. So going forward, um, it's these peak events that we we really need to be uh, uh, keeping in mind when we do think about um, how we're interacting with our landscapes and how we can build resilience into our into our farming systems. These are some close-ups from uh, just from Google Earth imagery uh, of some of the farm sites, um, and you'll you'll be as I, I'll just cycle through these. But as you uh, as I cycle through, you'll see I think fairly evidently that the land is split up into um, three broad classifications. One being a, a brownish kind of uh, area, which um, is in this region here. Um, which is kind of characterized by ineffective water cycles. It's uh, a stagnation of the ecosystem and you see a shift from grass, uh, from fun functioning grassland through acid grassland and eventually into that heather formation. Um, the second characterization is these uh, pockets where native woodland regeneration has begun at some point in the past and has kind of taken over to dominate these areas. And then the third point are areas on the landscape where we have um, more effective, um, what we consider to be more effective grassland scenarios where grazing pressure has kind of kept it in check. Uh, so these sites range in, in size from um, sort of 40 odd acres, 43 acres down to about eight uh, acres. The contours that you see on the maps are 10 meter contours. So some of them have quite a lot of elevation drop and some of them like this one here have, have very, very little. Although this one here, uh, Corderi, is um, down uh, next to the, the major lake in the area. So it does, it's sitting right at the bottom of the catchment. So water passing through the site is a, is, is a big concern. The big thing for me, <coughs> this is how the land unit uh, across all five units is split up. Um, we've got about 65%, which is uh, in that point of succession that's uh, characterized by an ineffective water cycle. It's going to heather dominated or acid grassland, very low palatability and relatively low uh, nutritional value. 13% um, of the sites are covered in native woodland currently and uh, about 33% are um, in grassland. So you can see we've got quite a mixed bag there. Um, and even when we look at the, the, the sites on, on, the, on the larger scale map, We've got a lot happening in terms of aspect, um, elevation, and soil type. You know, some areas are are really characterised by uh, uh, peat-laden soils, um, waterlogged soils, and others are quite mineral and quite free draining. So, uh, one of the the biggest challenges for me, certainly in the in the early days, was just how like how do I get my my hands around this? How do I deal with this complexity? Where do I even begin? Um, and ultimately, that question was answered by getting really, really clear. It sounds a bit kind of intuitive now, but the, uh, the holistic management framework and ultimately the steps that uh, you can follow through to define your context um, allows you to get really, really clear and really honest about what is possible and uh, indeed where you want the sites to go. When you get clear about your context um, and you really, really drill down to what's important to you on a, on a very, very basic level, um, decision making becomes one hell of a lot easier. Uh, the other thing that I did know for sure at the start was that the existing model of farming in this area um, was failing communities and failing the landscape. Um, traditionally, most of the farms in this area would, uh, would be predominantly uh, sheep operations that are selling into a commodity market. Um, so there's very, very little happening in terms of um, there's nothing happening really in terms of uh, adding value to the product. It's it's purely a productivist uh, model where you're you're pushing for numbers and you're pushing uh, ecosystems as as, uh, as hard as you possibly can. So, in terms of um, dealing with uh, complexity, when it came to uh, when I first discovered. Um, the work of Alan Savory through that TED talk that I think everybody's seen. Um, I knew there was something in 
in his words and how he was presenting that, that was going to be of use. Um, initially, I was put off because a lot, most of the work seemed to be focused on arid regions of the world. But underpinning uh, holistic management are a series of, of principles and, and principles remain, say, remain universally true by their very definition, regardless of whether they're applied or uh, viewed in an, in an arid climate or, or in a very, uh, very temperate climate or wet climate like ours here. Um, and I've, holistic management is, is, a, is a, a huge, um, a huge su subject area from uh, decision making, financial planning, grazing planning. And I've just pulled out ecosystem processes here because this really was the lens that uh, allowed me to really get a handle on what was going on. And I found this um, probably one of the most, certainly in my early days, one of the most uh, useful elements of, of holistic management. So the first uh, ecosystem process is the water cycle. Um, obviously of huge importance here in these wet temperate climates where we get a lot of rain. Um, Ineffective water cycles at the very, very basic level um, result in acidic conditions. Acidic conditions in our soil result in the lockup of minerals and nutrients, and ultimately they limit the, um, the variety of species we can grow on a, on, a, on a particular plot of land. Now, I'm going to be talking here from my unique context, um, uh, purely from the, eye, from the eyes of growing grass. I'm not talking about any other form of agriculture. Um, so, you know, how do we go about repairing these? Well, the, the, the traditional uh, approach, of course, has, has been to, to uh, uh, we've got two options. We, we use it or we lose it. The lose it scenario uh, traditionally has been uh, a big push for, for drainage, um, a big push for controlling water and funneling it away from, uh, from sites um, and basically getting it a, 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 a away from areas um, that we deem, to, we, we deem should be productive as quick as possible. The other option we do have, though, is to use it. And by considering, um, you know, what are the pumps in nature, and uh, um, and how can we uh, integrate them on our farms to to essentially kickstart water cycles again? Um, and the answer is trees and grass. Really, if we can get um, shrub species and trees growing um, through their um, natural cycles of evapotranspiration, they pull water up from the soil and get water moving again. The problem is when we have uh, soil inundated with water that's um, completely stagnant. When we get water moving up through the biomass in, in trees and shrubs and, and get it uh, uh, transpirated up, uh, up and out into the atmosphere, we see local improvements in grass production. Um, this um, anecdotal perhaps ob observation is held out by um, some more scientific observations that were carried out the Pont Bren project in Wales, which is a very, very uh, similar proxy to our own scenario here in Donegal, high rainfall, mountainous area, um, where they identify that water infiltrates up to 67 times faster beneath um, hedgerows and tree lanes. Of course, this has a knock-on effect as well if we're talking about farms that are based high up in catchments. It means that water is, actually instead of it actually sheeting off and um, combining to, to, to add to uh, flood events further downstream, which cause mass devastation, um, we can actually hold water higher up on slope, get it to infiltrate into our soils, and it becomes more of a slow release process over time, rather than the in initial inundation that we would see in these barren kind of bare uh, uplands. So um, the benefits that we see of uh, a more complete, effective water cycle um, actually have massive um, positive upsides uh, far downstream from our farms. The second area is uh, the mineral cycle. And unfortunately, uh, the, the, the picture there on the right hand side is very, very typical of a lot of west of Ireland, where we have massive tracts of land, very, very little tree cover, and ultimately I would say ineffective water cycles uh, here as well. Now, um, in this scenario here, we've got uh, an extensive approach to grazing whereby you can really see there's very, because the animals aren't bunched together, they don't, they're not moving. We see very, very little in the way of animal impact. They tread carefully and they only eat the very uh, select of the, the, the growth tips that are, that are available to them. Um, but we end up with this kind of ecological stagnation. And ultimately what happens is that the, the biomass falls over, uh, forms a thatch, um, and the growth points of, uh, of those plants in the vicinity are, are shielded out, thus preventing any kind of regeneration. 
Um, so we get a, 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 the longer we go down this timeline, we get a more and more of a shift towards unpalatable species and species uh, low diversity and species of low uh, lower nutritional value. Whereas if we were to bunch animals together and keep them moving, any biomass that wasn't eaten in this scenario would be trampled. And by putting that biomass down and in contact with the soil surface, uh, biological breakdown can begin to occur by the, uh, the soil food web. Uh, energy flow. Um, in this, uh, the simplest form of, of um, the simplest way that, that I, I consider this is by uh, how many photosynth different photosynthesizing surfaces do we have pointing up at the sun? Because everything, um, when it comes to energy flow, I mean, our, our chief uh, form of production uh, on any farm is photosynthesis. It's uh, how much light are we capturing? How effective are our uh, biological systems in terms of our soil food web support uh, and our, um, our water cycle? in allowing plants to do what they've evolved to do, which is ultimately turn sunlight into carbon and sugars and pump them where they belong, be that either growing animal or feeding the soil food web. And again, this kind of comes back into uh, different layers of production as well. We can begin talking about um, the, the approach mentioned previously, which was the difference between extensive grazing versus more, uh, more managed grazing, um, which potentially kicks up our, our uh, level of production on farms. But also things like agroforestry as well, when we begin to put tree lanes into these farms that are potentially um, producing nuts or fruit, these other forms of production can actually be added in with very little, um, if any, uh, negative impact on, on the base production, which in our case would be grass. When it comes to extensive grazing and leaving animals unchecked, this is kind of what we see at the other end. This is truly degenerative. This is a, an ecosystem that is falling over or is <laughs> probably face down dead uh, in, in many ways. It's important to realize that when we look at these systems that um, you know nature is a very, very dynamic being depending on the timeline we choose to view it. Now, if we're casually viewing this type, this kind of landscape on a, on a five year timeline, this, um, the, these short kind of mindsets or short term mindsets um, lead us down these scenarios without us really realizing what we're doing. Um, this site here isn't on my own farm, it's on a, another site that I'm beginning to work with, um, the farmer over in West Donegal. And this is, um, this is the culmination of sort of 80 years of unchecked um, uh, summer grazing of, of, of sheep. Um, we can see here in some of the pictures where um, the original kind of soil height uh, would have been. Um, what's happened here essentially is uh, overgrazing of more palatable species. Um, species that are less palatable are, are allowed to express their full physiology and go to seed and th thus proliferates. So with time you end up with palatable nutritious species uh, uh, disappearing as they disappear, you end up with bare, uncovered soil um, being exposed to the elements. And in these high rainfall environments, it doesn't take long for erosion to begin occurring. And once erosion takes hold, um, away it goes. You're quite literally watching the wealth of, of yourself and future generations wash away down the hillside. Um, and the real poignant thing for me is that when we walk on these sites, as depicted in the picture on the right, a lot of these sites grew forests at some point in the past, and the evidence is right there in front of us. Now, when you walk on these sites, they're, they're windswept. You know, we're talking about centimetres uh, in very, very localised spots of soil depth. There's not a hope of, uh, of, of us replanting these areas without major, major intervention in the short term. Um, but it's important that we do use these sites to, 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 to kind of force us to to step back and to keep that long-term vision. Um, so when we're making day-to-day -day decisions on the farm about moving animals or, you know, have we, have we grazed uh, enough there? Have we overgrazed in that area? Uh, and we're thinking about managing for recovery as the holistic management model, um, as is the base of the of holistic plan grazing. Um, we need to be uh, having these kind of scenarios in the back of our mind. Community dynamics um, for me is all about um, the last of the ecosystem processes is all about uh, how nature builds resilience and it builds resilience through diversity. 
we think about uh, complicated mechanisms versus complex uh, uh, mechanisms, be they in nature or um, or mechanical means. We think about the the Swiss watch there on the left, which is a very very fine, uh, highly tuned, highly engineered timepiece. But if we remove the most mundane element from it, the whole system just falls by the wayside. Um, whereas if we consider something like the Soil Foodware, which is on the right hand side, this is a, d a diverse dynamic system where each node has many many connections within this burgeoning kind of web of life. If we were to, in a healthy soil food web scenario or any of nature's systems, if we remove one single node from that system, the whole system rebalances, um, but still ultimately keeps on functioning um, up until a certain point of, of collapse. Now, I would argue that our current form of, of um, agriculture, which is based on a lot of inputs, um, uh, you know, we, we hear you can't turn on the TV or the radio these days without hearing about the negative impacts of agriculture. Um, and the word that's always missing for me from those news reports is agricultural model. The, the current model that we're subscribed to is a linear model. It's inputs and outputs. It's a system where we are um, creating the economic conditions where it is deemed as viable for us to, to fell vast tracts of rainforest, to grow soy or, or to, uh, to support the uh, development of industrial uh, concentrated animal feedlots, and then supplying a very, very underpriced and under quality, poor quality product to the market. Um, if we go back to how um, that, and that, that linear model is only kind of 50, 60 years old. We go back to a time, even 70, 80 years ago, we, were, we looked at farms that farmed more in the way of, of, of a, a complex system whereby the farm was actually part of, uh, of a social network uh, that first and foremost fed the family upon which, um, uh, who relied upon it, fed neighbours, fed local communities, and we either stepped into, a, into a scenarios where we had barter trade or, or regional trade um, around the area. And at the moment, we're, we're not in those, we're not in those um, scenarios at all. We have a, a scenario where a farmer in these hills will, um, will raise a lamb, We'll sell that lamb into an international commodity market, take the check he gets, uh, cash it, minus commissions, and then go and buy lamb from New Zealand or some other part of the world in order to feed his family. Um, and I would argue a lot of people that I speak to don't see themselves as growing food anymore. Um, they're, they're sheep farmers or, or cattle farmers. Um, that connection with, with real food um, and the people in place has, has kind of been broken in this chase towards a linear system. When we look at any, any system um, uh, through the lens of holistic management, um, these are the tools that are available to us. Um, the options um, uh, are, they're not limited, they're limited only by our own human creativity, but when you consider how ecosystems have evolved over time, these are the tools um, of fire and rest and animal impact that, are, um, that have been used for millennia. Um, money and labor is a relatively, uh, particularly mechanized labor is a, is a relatively new addition to the game as is technology. But ultimately, um, these are the tools in our arsenal and it's a, a coordinate, it's a combination of how we use these tools that's ultimately going to drive our systems towards regenerating, building soil, building uh, resilience through diversity or degenerating systems back to that scenario where we're ending up with where we're eroding um, our generational wealth from the very soil beneath our feet. Um, I'll finish um, on this slide, I think. Um, this is a slide is the product of the work of a lady called Elaine Ingham, or Dr. Elaine Ingham, who's a soil scientist. I came across this slide uh, in particular um, probably six months into my initial journey and I put it to one side because I, I couldn't get my head around it and it was only after visiting holistic management um, and becoming familiar with the, the four ecosystem processes and the tools available to us that it all made sense for me. This, this was kind of the linchpin uh, for me. Whenever I walk in, into, a, into a field or, or a particular ecological niche, niche, in the back of my head I'm always thinking on this sliding scale from bare ground on the left to um, mature old growth forest on the right. 
um, I'm asking myself where currently the ecological niche uh, sits. Um, so on the left, we have a system that's characterized by low diversity. Um, any of those ecosystem processes that, are, that were mentioned earlier on um, are probably ineffective or functioning in a very, very poor state. Where systems towards the right of the, of the spectrum um, are, are more resilient, they're more productive, and they're, um, they, they can handle the shocks of extreme weather events or extreme disturbance uh, in, a, in, a, in a more effective manner than the systems on the left hand. Once we've identified where, where uh, our particular, um, which ecological, which succession niche we, uh, we inhabit on any land that we're managing, the next question that comes up is which way do I want to push it? Do I want to push it to the right or to the left? So for example, if I was entering a, an area that was dominated by young pioneer scrub, it may suit me to, to push that system towards the right, to, to push it towards uh, a, an early pioneer woodland. Perhaps I'm trying to establish a shelter belt on, on one of my more exposed sites here on the farm. Similarly, it may suit me to push that same ecological niche, that same uh, niche in succession towards the left on the scale, which is back into more of a, a functioning grassland because I'm trying to build my, uh, my grazing platform a bit more. Um, the only difference in uh, whether I decide to push um, this discrete niche to the right in this diagram or to the left, the, the, the only difference in outcome is how I choose to apply those tools that are available to us. Um, and you essentially, w my own experience is when I keep this uh, model in my mind and I'm constantly uh, kind of making these decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, whether or not it's about erecting new fences or how I'm moving animals through a landscape or maybe the stocking density of, of bunching animals and moving them around, um, I'm, ke I'm keeping this in mind and ultimately playing that long-term game with day-to-day -day decisions. My own statement of purpose here for the farm um, was, as I mentioned at the start, was, uh, was born from that subliminal messaging that I received as a teenager, which was that really there was, there's no future in these hills um, and that the only option is to get educated and get out. And it took me a long time to realize that that didn't sit well with me. So I have, I operate from the, from the, the fundamental belief that this ecosystem that we inhabit here in central Donegal uh, ultimately is is sick and, and kind of needs our help. Now agriculture can be, uh, if managed holistically and managed to, toward a context that suits uh, or, or, or a, a context that's well thought out in terms of um, the generations to come, can be part of that solution. Um, my own understanding at the moment is that the ecosystem around me is nowhere near peak and uh, to be honest, we don't know what the, this, peak of, this ecosystem is even um, capable of because it's been so long. It's certainly out with li living memory since we lived in a, in a healthy, abundant um, uh, landscape in this particular region. So my own uh, holistic context boils down to these couple of sentences here, which is I'm in the business of exploring the limits of this local ecosystem processes by supporting regenerative approaches to meeting human, ecological, and financial needs. And that triple bottom line um, for me is, is what's missing in all other uh, approaches to management. Through reductionist thinking, we end up with these linear models which force us to chase economies of scale. Um, and the only metric we choose to measure are our economic ones. It's, it's ultimately revenue and profit. But we see where those models lead us. We see where those approaches lead us. It leads us into soil erosion. It leads us into the erosion of human capital, whereby you know we, we have kids growing up in these areas that don't even know where food comes from, and then arrive at the uh, the idea when they're 18, 19, that the only option available to them is to leave. Um, so we're not only eroding the soil beneath our feet, we're eroding the very society uh, that has sustained generations in the past. And I believe if we get back towards uh, a semblance of healthy functioning ecosystems, then those healthy functioning social systems will also follow and generations to come uh, after me will, um, will be able to survive and indeed thrive in these glens. So I'll leave it there.
Thank you so much, John. That was really fascinating. And we already have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to get started. Um, the first question is, what's the distance between each of your plots? Maybe what's the shortest and what's the longest distance, just to give us an idea of the scale. So we're talking about um, sort of four to five kilometers at the longest point. Um, but bear in mind, we've got a big lake in the middle of that. So um, we're kind of hampered by the road network. So to drive from one to the other could be sort of 35, 40 minutes on a bad day. Right. <laughs> okay. And then we've got a lot of questions about the grazing. And l l there's um, several questions kind of just asking about how do you move your sheep? Is it, do you, when do you decide to move them? Is it by a visual image? Are you looking at the height of the grass or are you using some measure of time? How do you manage the grazing so that it's effective is the big question. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting one because when I, I first read about, uh, when I first got into holistic management, of course, I think like a lot of people, the hook was grazing. And I didn't really have an, an understanding of what the what the, the broader package was, and every element is is necessary. Um, so the difference between, or the the, the kind of dif uh, the definition often shared, and the difference between mob grazing and holistic land grazing, is um, that they both look the same. They're both about bunching animals together and moving them. Um, holistic land grazing is getting the right animals in the right place at the right time for the right reasons. The right reasons element comes back to that discussion that I spoke about earlier on, which was whether or not we um, we want to push the ecological niche to the right or to the left. The right time is all about recovery um, because we're, we're trying to promote uh, root growth um, uh, as much as possible to sequester as much carbon into, into the soil as possible. Um, so when I first started out, um, under the holistic management um, sort of study packs, um, it gives you uh, um, various uh, techniques um, to try and estimate what a daily um, amount of forage might be in particular areas. But I soon found that with a with a dynamic uh, system, that um, once you make your first assessment, um, when you come back to move those animals after you know, 12 hours or 24 hours or, or however long you've decided to, to leave them in a particular area, you're already carrying out those assessments. And after two or three days, it becomes more of a, less of a science and more of an art form. Um, your, your brain and your eye kind of tunes into how much uh, forage is available uh, to them, how much they will eat or they're likely to eat in the time period you're given. But also the big important, um, the really important part of the, the equation is how much we're leaving behind. Because of course, we're only aiming to, to eat roughly a third of the forage that's available to us and trample the rest. Um, by trampling the rest, um, uh, of course, the, the, the conventional thinking is that, you know, that, that matter is wasted. Um, it looks untidy, but the, the truth is borne out that we're actually composting that in place. When you bunch animals together, particularly in soils that have low biological activity, like some parts of my own farm, um, you bunch animals together, you get a really, really high concentration of dung and urine in those areas, which are essentially biologically inoculating that biomass and it's helping to speed up the digestion of that biomass that we've trampled down uh, from the forage. Um, so we're actually feeding the soil, feeding the soil food web, and we're growing soil from above and below. So we're growing soil from below by promoting root growth and we're growing soil from above by essentially composting in place with this high injection of nutrients and biology. Um, but there are other anecdotal kind of um, benefits as well. For example, when we put that mulch down on the surface um, or when the animals put that mulch down on the surface for us, I should say, we're uh, trapping moisture at the very, very surface of that soil. Now, what does that mean? Well, for example, in 2007, uh, 2018, when we had that extended dry period, um, we had, uh, I know in this land here, we had farms all around that were very tightly grazed, as is uh, uh, traditional in, in sheep country, you know, that kind of golf ball approach to grazing, whereby uh, no biomass is wasted, uh, to coin the, the, the current term. But ultimately, by grazing so tightly, you're not 
you don't have any mechanism to lock moisture in at the soil surface. And when moisture evaporates from the soil, the plants will stop growing and your recovery time extends out. I remember on that year in particular, on my own operation here, we were locking moisture in, so much moisture in at the, at the soil surface, our recovery times were actually going up and up and up. Um, to the point at which we, we couldn't get, I couldn't get, get around the farm, I only had a small flock of sheep. Uh, I couldn't get around the farm quick enough at the time. So we had lots and lots of, uh, of grass ahead of us. Now my own context in the last year has shifted um, uh, or so. So the last time I um, uh, uh, move, regularly moved livestock is about nine months ago. Um, but that, that's a slightly, that that's due to some uh well to, to, to a shift in some some uh, uh external externalities in my own situation but um we're getting um we're getting when it comes to grazing management this year uh, and ahead um what we're doing on the farm now is we want to shift towards heavier animals so we're looking at getting some uh, some rare breed or some heritage breed cattle in and potentially some donkeys in as well to make use of some of that rougher coarser vegetation and to get a bit more of a heavier animal impact um, to try and stimulate those areas a bit more. Oh, thank you for that. This next question uh, relates to areas of improved land that have been drained. And the mm -hmm. question he has is, how do we know whether to manage an area in its natural wetland or peat bog state or manage it as a grassland? How do you know? It's a great question. It's, it's a great question. So, um, I mean, I, I can only talk about my own uh, personal approach to that because I do have a mosaic of landscapes that are that are like that. I think the the, the first kind of misconception is that um, all peat must be protected. Now, in a, in a natural state, if we think about what this landscape would have looked like, uh, you know, uh, after, you know, about a thousand years, say, after the last uh, ice sheet left. We would have had uh, um, a much more of a, um, a tapestry, a mosaic of woodlands interspersed with peat, interspersed with uh, more functioning grasslands. So that's kind of the model that I try to refer back to. Um, peat formation on slope is actually a really unnatural thing. Uh, where we see acid grasses forming and that shift from grassland in towards the, in, in, into a heather stage of, of, um, of succession, um, which is, you know, ultimately down to ineffective water cycles. On slope, where that occurs on slope, that's actually a really, really, uh, it doesn't really happen in nature. Those slopes traditionally would have been wooded. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to, to get back to here. Um, there are areas of the farm that are ideal habitat for um, some endangered birds, uh, including uh, curlew, uh, snipe, um, and also marsh fertility butterfly uh, and some other kind of cool uh, kind of insect species that, that, that are beyond my ken uh, at the moment. And those are certainly areas that I would kind of, I've kind of resigned myself that, you know, I'm not looking at, at pushing production on, on every single square inch of the, gra of the farm. I'm actually looking to, to, to value those, those niches where they're appropriate, uh, appropriate in terms of a healthy, ecological system. Um, so I, I would have no qualms about, you know, uh, trying to um, short circuit succession in areas of peak formation that are uh, unnatural, like for example on slope. Uh, how would I do that? So I might go in there with, with, and use herd effect uh, to, to try and stimulate um, uh, and trigger the next phase in succession to allow those shrub species to come in. I may decide to reduce the, the latency of those natural succession cycles by going in and planting up and then and then excluding stock from those areas for some time until until the trees and shrubs take hold but I would only I wouldn't do that I wouldn't um, use those tools in, in, in a blanket approach wherever I saw um, a peat for example because uh, you know holistic management holistic thinking is all about valuing what's there what's supposed to be there and ultimately trying to value trying to, to get yourself to tune back into um, to what is a healthy functioning state. Um, trying to make everything look like a uh, golf ball uh, or a uh, uh, golf green um, productive grassland uh, is in another form 
the same reductionist thinking that would ultimately lead us to 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 the destruction of our soils, you know. Thank you. We've got another question related to grazing. Um, the question is, can holistic plan grazing eliminate the need to burn hills in order to control heather? Can the high impact of sheep strip off or weaken heather in your experience? Yeah, this this is the thing, right? So it's um, the, the, the short answer is yes, absolutely it can. When we think about though that slide that I, I had about the, the tools that were available to us, um, fire is on that list. Animal impact is also on that list. Now th there are there are many ways to skin a cat, right? There are many ways to achieve the same end uh, through different combinations of those tools. Um, we don't necessarily want to use fire because you know take your pick any number of reasons. But a potential dangerous scenario if it goes out of control. Um, uh, we're liberating carbon from the atmosphere, and I would argue that a far more effective way to um, uh, to get us to cycle that thatch, uh, to lock down the carbon and to kick it back in succession, because ultimately that's what we're doing. We're shifting that ecological um, uh, niche to the left on that graph, um, is through animal impact. The, the problem is um, the management side of things. Um, one, we, uh, and this is quite a controversial point, but our, our hills are, are, are actually um, understocked and overgrazed. So what I mean by that is we don't have enough um, animals in our upland scenarios to, uh, first and foremost, to effectively uh, get the herd effect that we need on those broad, broader landscapes. Uh, secondly, of course, in the absence of predators, we don't have the that uh, that bunching uh, effect, which is going to get us. Um, get us the impact we need either. So we do need to resort to things like um, uh, electric fencing, um, but that in and of itself is is very contentious, particularly when we're talking about grazing, uh, perhaps commonage uh, areas where there are a number of different um, commonage holders in an area. I mean, you know, unless you're on really good terms with your neighbors, um, it could be quite delicate to be seen going to uh, up the hill to, to put up fences, regardless of how temporary they are. Um, there's some cool stuff coming through in the way of radio collars, which are based on um, uh, smartphone apps and GPS tech um, out of South Africa, which are, are looking at um, digital ways to keep livestock bunched together and moving. And that could be quite cool, um, but I don't think it's there yet. But in short answer, yeah, um, by, you know, it, I, I truly believe that um, in these upland scenarios, herd effect is, is a really potentially um, very effective way to, to, to kick those um, landscapes back into a more effective water cycle, back into, into grassland. You know? uh, thank you, John. I've got uh, one more question and several people are asking, will we issue a recording later? And, and yes, we will. Um, this one's asking about hefting. Um, how do you deal with an extensive hefted system? with very little fencing in a regional park? <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, so part part of the farm uh, here, um, which which I didn't mention, is an extensive area of mountain, which is completely open. And I haven't been able to arrive at an answer uh, to, to, to that particular question yet. Um, but it's a really interesting one. And, and if we're going to get serious about, um, uh, for whatever reason, if we're going to get serious about truly regenerating regenerating these upland uh, areas we need to get to the bottom of that scenario um there's uh, i visited some projects in scotland um that are doing really really awesome work but they're kind of easier to get your hands around because very often they're in private ownership and it's easy when somebody um like one project in, in the tala hartfell region in the central belt is ten thousand hectares and they've got one landowner to deal with i mean they've got a number of stakeholders but they've essentially got one decision maker to deal with so that becomes a much much simpler um, uh, um, problem to solve in these scenarios um, the human element becomes a limiting factor the, those social interactions become a limiting factor rather than what we can do ecologically um, and again I guess the other part of, of that answer is it depends which way you want to push it um, so 
when we talk about hefting, you're talking about um, uh, uh, sheep or, or livestock that, that kind of um, have free reign but tend to, to, to hang around in a particular area. Um, it might be that our um, decision or our context wants us to, to allow succession to, to take place. So it might be that we're looking to apply the tool of rest uh, to those scenarios. And there are dozens and dozens of examples up in these hills behind me where um, we have uh, valley systems that are really, really steep. And, um, you know, typically they, they lead down to water courses. And on the edge of these water courses, we see what would be the remnant of a functioning ecosystem or what a natural functioning ecosystem would be like in these hills after the last ice age. And when you go into them, um, you know, we think that this, this barren uh, um, kind of one dimensional um, stagnant landscape is romantic and, and uh, um, the Irish Tourist Board do a great job of, of, of pushing it, you know, um, pushing the austerity on, on, on tourists and saying like this is as natural and as wild as it gets. When in reality, it's an ecosystem on its knees. Um, the national park to the north of me here is called Glenvey. Uh, which is an anglicized version of the old Irish uh, name for, called uh, uh, Glen Vaha, which is the Glen of Birch. Um, the mountains are called the Derry Bay Mountains, the Dura Vaha, which is the, the, the hillside basically of uh, oak and birch. Where are the oak and the birch? Well, they're in functioning remnant ecosystems in these very, very steep gorges. That's where they are. So um, the hefting question um, is really context spe specific in my book. Um, and it, and, it, and it, it's really dependent on, on which way we want to, to encourage the, uh, the, that ecological niche. Thank you for that, John. And I think what these questions and your dialogue is highlighting is, you know, what holistic management enables us to do is come up with our own better answers to our own questions. And, there's no one right answer to any of these questions is there. Exactly, yeah. So it's like, so, you know, if you, look, if you think about these linear, you know, the linear system that we've kind of been sold upon, it's um, all of the advice is transmitted into us. You know, we, we look for government agencies or, or we look from, you know, the very people that are selling us the inputs to, to tell us how, how most efficiently to run our operations. And we need to get empowered again. and. In, uh, the first step on that on that path to empowerment is about getting really really clear and focused about our own context and where we want this vision of a landscape or, or of a social landscape uh, uh, to go and how do we take steps today to make sure that we're progressing towards that vision super thank you john i am going to um switch gears here just for a couple of minutes and talk about what are some ways that a person could um, learn how to do this for themselves. Okay, so we've got another webinar coming up soon. I hope you see my screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, good. We've got another webinar coming up on the 23rd of January, Dr. Yena, uh, a soil scientist from Australia, who will be talking about how we can use the Earth's natural hydrological cycle to cool our planet. It, it's going to be very stimulating and that will actually be a two-hour conversation with Walter. We're doing holistic management training at Cross Lanes Organic Farm in County Durham in England in February and we'll be doing training uh, in collaboration with John at his farm and this is actually uh, got a bursary from National Organic Training Skill Net for Irish citizens. And if you, so if you want to do that, be sure to sign up on the Knots website, not the 3LM website. You'll get the discount on the Knots website. <laughs> 
Um, this is Vivian Tebby, and she is an accredited professional in Germany. She and I will be co-training holistic management in Germany at the end of March. And then we also do online classes. And uh, so our next online class is starting on uh, March 11th on holistic planned grazing. Um, Savory Institute also offers a self-study at your own pace, kind of an online course. And if you use this link, um, it will enable you to get a 10% discount. And you can also become an accredited educator with 3LM. And if that's of interest to you, let me know. Subscribe to our, U our 3LM YouTube channel. We have got tons of videos out there related to holistic management. And subscribe to our newsletter for local news about holistic management. And I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, I've got one more question I want to ask you, John. And um, you, you and I were talking about, you know, how did you ease in to, you know, once you learned holistic management, how did you ease into that practice? Did that come easily? Was it kind of hard? Do you have any tips about it? How do you make that transition from, I just learned all this stuff in a classroom. Now, what do I do with it on my farm? Well, the, the, the top tip that springs to mind is that when you do the nine day training, like I did, you go and lie in a darkened room for like 20 days because your head is fried. There's, there's a lot of ground covered uh, in that time. And, and I found that when I walked away, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I was just swimming with, with information and kind of new, um, a new, a new energy basically. Um, and it took a long time and it's it's still ongoing. I mean, I did training, what, was it two years ago? I think with you guys and um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it takes a long time to get into it. And I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still very much on that journey. And there are, I, you know, there are times when, you know, I, I still refer back to uh, other people that are perhaps practicing this for, for a period of time longer than I am or the coursework that we covered in, in the nine day class or, or the, or the handbooks. Um, don't expect things to, to change overnight um, would be the, the top tip really. Um, the, the, uh, the, the presentation I made of, of that, that succinct uh, sort of extract of my own personal context took me two and a half years to arrive at that. Now I understand what's gone in on, on a personal level, on an emotional level, on an intellectual level to boiling that down to, to that succinct phrase. Um, and that's ultimately what it what informs me day to day, but um, but it, it, it's a long it's a long process. So don't, don't be disheartened. Um, um, you'll you you will get through there. You will get through it. Um, it's not rocket science. There there is a lot to it, um, but you'll I think you find that it's um, it allows you once things begin to click, um, rather than a very laboured way and a, a linear way of making decisions. Um, you begin to, to to approach problems and decisions in a, in a from a from a very very different place, um, and they actually it feels as if you're kind of unburdening really, um, because you set your context and, and you, you're very very clear about that. You've been uh, probably as honest with yourself uh, as you've ever been in your life about what's gone into that holistic context document. Uh, decision making flows um, in, in in a more fluid fashion uh, after it, particularly using the. the the holistic management framework. So uh, have faith. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. You've really um, given us your all tonight. And I so very much appreciate uh, the heart and soul that you put into your presentation. And it's really informed us a lot about um, how to use holistic management in a farm setting. So thank you so much.